Well, we are starting a new series, brand new series, um, and I'm going to try to unpack the why today, okay? Um, as you can see, it's going to be the Gospel of John, and we're not going to be in the Gospel of John today. I want to set up the, the why. This series could go, I don't do this typically. Typically, I do like, I know I'm going to do a four-week series on this or a six-week series on that. This one, we'll see. We'll see. We're going to go through John. But today, I told you when I was on sabbatical, I was really going to be spending time praying and trying and trying and asking God to give me a fresh word. And I'm going to let you in a little bit on that process. And what I feel God uh, spoke to me uh, during my sabbatical. Now, when I say spoke, um, there was no burning bush. There was, I know, right? That'd be cool, wouldn't it? There, you know, there was no light that blinded me for a few days. But I tell you this, uh, when you spend time seeking and asking God for wisdom, and you use the word of God as your barometer, your, your, your guide, he will speak to your heart. And those messages that God gives you, they're deep. They're, 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 they go deeper than just hearing. They're, they're unmistakable. And, and then there's the wisdom part that comes in and says, all right, this is what I feel God is saying to me. Now I'm going to share this with people that I trust who are spiritually minded and mature in the faith, and I'm going to test that spirit, and I'm going to see, is, was it God, or was it just because I was away by myself and ate five frozen pizzas in a row? <laughs> Which one is it? And that's the wisdom part. There's wisdom in a multitude of counselors, not just anybody, but people that are spirit-filled and uh, biblically minded. So I'm going to let you in on some of the things that I feel God, I'm going to tell you what God worked in me, and maybe you can relate. How about that? Okay? So let's open with a word of prayer and ask God to, to speak to us in this moment. Lord, thank you for this time we could be back together. I have been so, so excited about being back with my brothers. I've missed them. There's something missing when we don't see each other from week to week. So God, I'm thank you. I thank you for this opportunity. And Lord, I pray that as you've spoken to me and you've given me some direction maybe for what the church should look to in the coming months and years, God, I pray that you would also speak to our own hearts and help us to, to find a word from you for the season that we're, up, we're coming up against. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I don't know where you are, but I know God does, and I know he has a word for you if you'll just ask. Okay, first verse I want to talk, I want to read to you today. It's kind of the opening. It's kind of the, the, the big idea, so to speak, and it's this, James 4.8. James 4.8, do we have that one? Is our background not working? There we go. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Ah, ouch. And purify your, purify your hearts, you double-minded. Ooh. That's, that was the hook that God um, kind of got me, got me with when I was going into my time of, uh, well, just for, uh, just for a break now, at the beginning of our sabbatical, we went to California, my, my family and I. We were there for two weeks. We'd, we went hiking. We went saw some big trees. <laughs> they were big. There's about five sermons in the pocket from those trees, so get ready. Um, and then we went to Disneyland, the happiest place on earth. I don't know how that's possible when every child was crying. <laughs> <laughs> and all the dads were like, get me out of here. I had fun. Um, and then I came home, and I went, out, uh, I went to New Hampshire by myself. I, that verse that I was thinking about was, where does my help come from? <laughs> the mountains, right? Go to the mountain. So I was like, I'm going to do some hiking. I'm going to do some praying. I'm going to do some writing. 
And all that time, this is what a hook. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. And that was where I stopped. I'm like, okay, okay. We're going to do that. I'm going to draw an ear to God. And then he said, dot, dot, dot. Don't forget the second part. Cleanse your hands, you sinner. And purify your heart, you double-minded. <coughs> I want to talk today, two words. First word is ownership. Ownership. Let me read a passage from you from Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16, verse 13. And it says this. Let you guys get there. Leave you guys a chance to get there too. It says this. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? <coughs> they replied, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Then Jesus turned to them and said, but you, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus responded, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my father in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on the rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. I'll give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. I think I went longer than my verse was saying, but this is the verse that, that God captured with me, me with, and I'm going to tell you why. I'm going to tell you why, and I'm going to unpack it for you. Caesarea Philippi was an important Gentile city during Jesus' time. All right? Let me give you some background on this city. Caesarea Philippi was an impressive Greco-Roman city near a huge spring that came out of a cave and is one of the main sources of the Jordan River. Okay, so north of Caesarea Philippi is this mountain called Mount Hermon. Hermon, some pronounce it, potato, potato. And out of that snow melt comes this spring that came out of this cave. Okay. It's about 30 miles north of the Sea of Galilee and is at the foothills of that mountain. Now, Baal worship took place here during a period of the kings of Israel. Baal worship. Now, let me just tell you what that components of that was. Baal worship included child sacrifice and ritualistic mutilation. It was close to a high place where Jeroboam set up a golden calf for the northern tribes of Israel to worship, which led to their downfall. Caesarea Philippi was originally called Penion, after the Greek god Pan. Okay? Now, Pan, there's a picture of him. Pan was a half-human, half-goat-looking creature. Basically, our modern understanding of what the devil looks like. I mean, if you see a picture of the devil, this he's got, he's got goat legs in the goat... Pan was the god of fertility. And they figured Pan would be the god to worship at this spot because from that spot, there was a spring that watered the rest of Israel. So it brought fertility to the, the Jordan River brought fertility to the entire region. So this must be where Pan rules. Okay? Um. The Romans incorporated it into their place of false god worship as well. The different pagan shrines, and there's a picture of this, different pagan shrines were built into a huge rock cliff that dominated the site. Look at this. This is what, and then Pan, Pan was an idol, and he sat right in there. This particular temple is in front of the cave, and there was massive uh, pagan worship that was done in there. It was literally considered the gates of, of the underworld, or better known as the gates of hell. Children were thrown alive into the entrance of the cave as sacrifices to the god Pan, believing that they would appease the gods and bring fertility to their crops and their families. What? 
So we want a big family and good crops, so let's kill our baby. That's insane. Their thought was, if you sacrificed your fertility to the God, he would make you prosperous in other ways. Hmm. Every time you deal, I'm just going to tell you, every single time, almost without fail, every single time you deal with dem demonic worship, there is an element of child sacrifice. I don't think you need to go too far to see where I'm going with this. Tell me the gods are dead. I don't believe it. The lowercase G-O-Ds, they're still alive and well. And, and, and we're worshiping them in America today, too. You've got to be very careful. All right. I'm, I'm getting back on the history. The history part makes me excited. Okay. So this, so that, I'm just setting the stage for you. This is where Jesus asked that question. There was no reason for Jesus to bring his disciples there. This is a pagan area. He's kind of breaking the rules by going here. <clears throat> And this is where he asked a very important question. Who do people say the Son of Man is? Think of them standing on a, on a hill. Go to the next slide, John, that, that, the one with the big rock. Yeah, look at this. This is the beginning of the Jordan River here. It used to come right out of that cave, but there was an earthquake some place in time, and it broke the connection between the pool and the cave. Um, anyway, why do you care? You don't care. Anyway, uh, I just think it's interesting. But this is, the, this is the rock that he's looking at. With all this knowledge and all these people worshiping false gods. And he's, he's looking at this and he says, who do people say that I am? <coughs> they said, John the Baptist. Okay. They were both alive at the same time. I don't know how that works, but whatever. Elijah, come back. Jeremiah, maybe Jeremiah. He was a prophet. Or one of the other prophets. Who do you say I am? I love the last two words of that. He uses the word I, the words I am. When you see the words I am in scripture, it should bring your mind back to that burning bush moment. I am that I am. Who do you say I am? Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And then I'm going to paraphrase here a little bit because we just read it out of the scripture. But he said, ah, oh, Peter. My Father in heaven has granted you great insight. Though you are but a little stone. That's the word he used when he said you are rock. He used the word little stone to, to reference Peter. Although you are a little stone, your confession is foundational to the church I'm building. Because when he said uh, on this rock, he used the word for foundation stone in, in, the, in the Aramaic. You're a little stone, Peter, but I'm going to, on this rock, on this foundation stone, I'm going to build my church. What is the foundation? What is it? That he is the Messiah. That he's the Messiah. On this rock, I will build my church, and on which, uh, which the rulers of the demonic realm cannot prevail against. I am the Christ. John 6, 40 says this. This is the will of the Father. That everyone who sees the Son and believes in him will have eternal life. And I will raise him up in the last day. The church is the disciples. When he's saying, I'm going to build my church, he's looking at all of them. He's like, I'm going to build my church. You know what it's not going to look like? It's not going to look like that. Shrines and buildings. And, but wait a minute, what did we do very quickly after the church was formed? What did we do? We built shrines and buildings, and government, and bureaucracy, because we like it. So, but, so here's the thing. He says, I'm going to build my church. It's not a place, or a shrine, or a system of religious orthodoxy. The church of Jesus Christ is people founded on the truth that Jesus is Lord and Savior. Giver of eternal life for all who put their hope in him. It's, now here's the thing. It's his 
church. He didn't say, Peter, you're going to build your church, and the gates of hell are not going to prevail against it. Did he say that? Did he say that? He said, I'm going to build my church. And that's where I, that's, that's the number one, ownership. God spoke to me in those moments. He says, hey, Dave. He calls me Davy boy. Hey, Davy boy, whose church is it? Whose church is it? And why did he have to say that to me? Because I'm, I was going to God with a bunch of questions like this. And I'll explain it. God, I don't know if this mall is going to be a crater in six months. I don't know if we're going to have a building. And I was actually literally saying to him this. God, I don't know how, and I don't want to. I'm not, I hate it. I don't know how to do a capital campaign. I don't know how to raise $2 million, $3 million, $4 million to build a building. I don't know how to do that. I, it's, I just, it's repugnant to me. I don't know how to build a building. I can remodel a building, but I don't know how to build a building. I don't even want to do that. I said, and so I said to God, God, if, if somebody else is better for this season of our church, let me know, and I will step aside. And I will step aside. I will, I will step aside for the next guy, the guy who can build, the guy who can, uh, who can raise money and all that stuff. Just, if that's what needs to happen, it's not my, it's not my church, it's your church. And I, what I heard him say is, if I wanted that guy, I would have hired that guy. I'm like, okay. <laughs> Part of me was like, okay, but you're going you're gonna to have to show up on this one. You know? <laughs> uh, uh, God and I get pretty candid with each other. It's his church, not mine. This is not my church. So I don't own it. Therefore, I don't have to worry about him prospering it as long as we are actually the church. We cannot, we, we cannot expect God to prosper something that he's not building. So we got to, so we, I, I have to check myself. Am I serving the church of God or am I serving something else? I mean, the quote, man, that uh, Selwyn gave last week, I was like, boom. He said this, I'm not afraid, it was William Carey, I'm not afraid of failure. I'm afraid of succeeding at things that don't matter. When he said that quote last week, I'm like, yep, that's, I, I was like, Selwyn, I need that quote. What if we succeeded in building and doing and being something that God was not in? I don't want to be a church. I want to be God's church. I don't want to be just another organization. We passed by yesterday. We passed by. We were driving. We, we, oh, I did my first quinceanera yesterday. And I went up to him after. I'm like, how bad did I do? And they're like, no, you did fine. I'm like, oh. I was so nervous. It was like my first wedding. I was like so nervous. And yesterday, I was like, I'm so nervous for this. I don't know what to expect. Anyway, I digress. The con the, the, we drove by a bunch of um, buildings yesterday that had a lot of people in them. They were the Knights of Columbus and the Elks Club. I, I, that's, I'm, not, I'm not knocking on them. I'm just saying I don't want to be that. I don't want to be just another organization that does good things and then you sit in the basement and drink. I don't, I don't want to do that. I, I, I want to be, be God's church because it says if we're God's church... The gates of hell can't prevail. What does that mean? It means the leadership of the demonic realm cannot prevail against us. Can anybody say amen? amen. Come on now. <sighs> That's the church I want to be in. That's the church I want to be a, a little stone in the foundation of. That's what I want to be. So I had, I, I had to get before God, uh, sitting on a stone on the top of a mountain and saying, God, forgive me for ways in which I've made this thing mine. I want to be part of Christ's church. So no matter what go, gets thrown at us, it will not prevail. Next word I want to talk about is priorities. 
Luke 10, 38, two stories. God, God often talks to me through stories, uh, scripture stories, and this is a big one. I'm gonna read it to you. It's Luke chapter 10, it says this. While they were traveling, he entered a village. And a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary, who was also sat at the Lord's feet and was listening to what he had to say. But Martha was distracted by many tasks. And she came up and asked, Lord, don't you care? Oh, man. How many times have you inadvertently prayed that prayer? Don't you even care? I, I, I have. Um, I don't know where we're going to be in a year. Don't you care, God? Of course he does. But it's, I, want, I want to know now. Nah, I, maybe I'm the only one who's asked that question. Don't you care that my sister has left me to serve alone? So tell her to give me a hand. I love the fact that Martha's like, Jesus, do what I tell you to do. <laughs> We've, I, you've never done that. Don't we always have like the right plan? And if God would just do what we tell him to do, everything would be better. All right, right? God, if you know me, if you know me for more than a millisecond, you know that I'm a planner. I like to have my T's crossed and my I's dotted. I almost got that wrong, <laughs> but I got it right. I mean, I like to have it laid out. And I like to tell God what would be best. And if he would just prosper my plan, we'd all get along a lot better. I guess I'm alone on that. What did the Lord say to him? Oh, well, I'm sorry. Mary, get up. What are you doing? And that's what he said. The Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, put your name in here. I put my name in here. You were worried and upset about many things. But one thing is necessary. Mary has made the right choice, and it will not be taken away from her. What do we care about? And what does Christ care about? Are they the same thing? I want you to think about that. If you were to make a, a graph today, and you would put things I care about and things that God cares about, how many times would it match? And I, I, got, I got a little, I'm telling you about my convictions over this time, things I was praying about. And I was praying, I was like, God, I, I mean, can you th I, put your, fa your, 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 your face in the situation, your, your name in the spot? David, David, you were worried about a lot of things. And, you know, if I can excel at anything in life, it's worrying. I'm a great, I'm an I'm Olympic warrior. <laughs> if there was an Olympic sport for worrying, I mean, I could be there. I could win that, at least the bronze. <laughs> but but I, always, I always justify it by saying this. I'm worried about the ch church stuff, right? Church stuff. I don't know what you're worried about, but some, my job is church stuff. You're like, what is even church stuff? Well, church stuff is like the air conditioning working, which is not. <laughs> church stuff is where are we going to be if they demo this mall? How are we going to finance a new location? When's the last time you thought about how we're going to finance a new location for this church? I mean, you know, that's okay. You're not supposed to have to think about that. But that's what is on my, my mind. That's what I worry about sometimes. The board knows, right? Gary's like, yeah, I, yeah, I hear you. Um, but here's the thing. First off, whose church is it? And second, what is the priorities of the church? That was the question I was praying about over sabbatical. And I was spending time in prayer. The Lord said to me, David, David, you are worried about uh, and bothered about a great many things, but one thing is necessary. What? What, Lord? What is the one thing that is necessary? If you want me to do one thing, what is it? 
coming to the transformative realization that I am the Christ, the Son of the living God. That is what I want for you, and that is what I want you to shepherd my people to do. I wrote it down because I wanted to make sure I got it right. To be so enthralled by my love for them that everything else fades. That's what God wants for me, and that's what he wants for you as a church. To be so intrigued by his teachings about this life and how we can live it to the full, that there are no dis- they are not distracted by any other voices. How distracting is our life right now? How many voices are vying for our attention and, honestly, sir, our, our, our lo- loyalty? To be so transformed that the church sees themselves and the world around them as the Father does. That coworker that drives you nuts? How does God see them? Another, another, another diagram for you to make. Take the person that annoys you the most, see how you see them, and see, write down how God sees them, and see how many things match. I'm just saying. It's tough. But that's what God wants to do. Let me read it again. This is what God wants for, for, for this church. When I mean church, I don't mean the building. We've got to get over that. I have, I, I have to get over that. Okay? This is what he wants. Coming to a transformative realization that he is the Christ. The son of the living God. And desiring to sit at his feet, to learn from him, to do what? To, to, what is that going to do for us? To be so enthralled by his love for, the, for, for us that everything else fades. To be so intrigued by his teachings about life and how we can live it to the full that we are not distracted by any other voices. And to be so transformed that, that we see ourselves, and the world around us as the Father does. Don't be so worried about the physical needs of the church, buildings, programs, and finances. Matthew 6, 32 through 34. For the world eagerly seeks all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be provided for you. Therefore, don't worry about tomorrow, because tomorrow tomorrow will worry about itself. I have no idea what that means, but I'm just going to let it go. God will build his church, and we, the church, are are to prioritize deeper and deeper fellowship with Christ. That is why God has been speaking to me in my personal walk about these things and for the future of this church. So here's, the, here's what some of the takeaways are, ready? We will be a mall church until we aren't. We will be a mall church until we're, 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 we are anymore. And I, that freaks me out. <laughs> I have no idea what the next phase is. God will provide the next step in our church's journey when and if he desires. We may never own a big, beautiful church campus like other churches do. Never, maybe. I I, I, I took my daughter to a couple uh, vacation Bible schools this summer, and I was kind of overwhelmed by some of these buildings. And I was that's part of part of the part of the that was before my sabbat before the um, time away in New Hampshire, and I was like a little bit like, this is overwhelming. I don't know how we can build this. I don't know how to do this. And he's like, yeah, you're, that's why you're at New Life and not here. <laughs> but 
if we draw close to Christ and invite others to do the same, then we will be about the Father's work, and he will supply all our needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. If that's what you want from a church, then you're in the right place. Because we are going to do our best to make that new life. If you want more stability and, uh, and facility, no hard feelings, but there's a church out there for you. Because that's probably not going to be us. And these are things I've had to die to a little bit. So let us as a church, as James 4.8 says, draw near to God and he will draw near to us. Which brings us to the Gospel of John. All that to get to the front of the series. <laughs> During my sabbatical, I slowly studied through the Gospel of John, trying to get a better glimpse of Jesus. It was so exciting to slow down and enjoy the story. I really want you to have that, a similar experience over the next few however long weeks it takes to do it. Let's slow down and sit at the feet of Jesus and just enjoy his presence. His stories. The stories about him and, and really get to know him for who he is. Let's not be double-minded, but let's draw near to God. And he, I believe he will draw near to us. So somebody asked me when I walked in the door, did you get the word that you wanted from, on your sabbatical? And I said, I'll talk a little bit about it today. So the answer is no. I didn't get the word that I wanted. I got a word. I wanted all the answers. I wanted to know what was happening, where we're going, what's going on. God, just download it, baby. <laughs> I'm an empty sponge. I got a word, and it kind of rocked my world a little bit. I'll be honest. Spent quite a, little, quite a lot of time sitting on very uncomfortable rocks on top of mountains, just praying, talking. If somebody came up behind me, they'd be like, this guy's psycho. <laughs> He's talking to himself. Luckily, I was on a very remote area, so there's only one guy, and he's like, you, he actually asked me, are you okay? <laughs> and I was like, yeah. He's like, okay, can, wh he's like, where do I go from here? I'm like, do you want the spiritual answer, or do you want the, <laughs> he's like, no, nah, just, it, where's the trail? I'm like, oh, it's over there. Uh, <laughs> we actually had a nice conversation. It was kind of fun. Anyway, but what I got, the word I got from God is that this is his church. And we can't get ahead of him. Because if we start making our own church, it's not actually the real church. It's something else. And that's where the enemy can, can get in and attack because it's not something that God can support. Because if you change it, it's not the church. It's like if you add to the Bible or take away from the Bible, it's not really the Bible anymore. It's not pure. So he's like, you know, you got to get on in, in, in my, make sure you're on my team and then I can, I can put all my energy and power into making sure that it is something that I can, I can build. And the second thing is, what are your priorities, Davy boy? Are you thinking a lot about vertical movement or horizontal movement or where the next, or are you, are you, are you Martha or are you Mary? And what I feel he wants us to do is he wants us to, to press in and be the Mary character in there. To sit at his feet, learn from him, get enthralled by him, and that should be our priorities. And then he'll take, he's, the board is, they'll, they'll worry about it. They'll, they'll do the worrying, right? I'll let you worry. Okay. <laughs> Gary's like, I don't worry. So anyway, uh, no. God's going to take us, and we're going to do, and we're going to be, we're going to be frugal, and we're going to do all those things. We're going to do the stuff. But that should not be our main priority. Right? That should not be our main priority. And that's God's dealt with me, and I'm going to try to unpack that 
um, in the practical with you as we move forward. So get ready for a very, very enjoyable time in the book, Gospel of John, as we get to know a little better who this Jesus is. Get ready to, maybe we'll just take the seats out, we'll sit at, no, I'm not going to do that. Um, <laughs> would you pray with me? Would you stand? Thank you.